My name is George Haraxon, and I am the Scholar Community Manager here at Reasons to Believe. Um, I also serve as an adjunct professor of philosophy and applied ethics at Azusa Pacific University. And for a lot of years, I was a, over 20 years, I was a pastor as well. I thought what I'd like to do is we will uh, allow me to pray, and uh, then I'll have uh, uh, Fuzz, AJ, and Paco introduce themselves and give a little bit of their professional background especially for those who are maybe might see this that are beyond the uh, scholar community and just want to know what their backgrounds are in that. But if you would uh, allow me to pray. Uh, Lord, we come to you in a very uh, different situation that we're not used to. And so first off, we uh, acknowledge your presence and invite your presence in the midst of this call that uh, you would not only be with us, that you would, as a community, uh, help guide this conversation, but most of all, that it would be uh, honoring and uh, of you. And for the community of people we have gathered here who have so many different expertise, background, we pray that uh, your influence and that what you've allowed us uh, to do as, as people, pool, may we pull our knowledge and may we be able to help one another, most of all, help others uh, beyond just this community. So we pray for our communion with you right now that you would be uh, with us. We pray for our surrounding communities, our immediate families, friends, and even those who uh, are hard hit uh, by what's going on. And ultimately, um, we look at this also for our, our, our mission, our commission that you've given us. So we ask that you would be able to use the material and the substance of this call uh, to reach others, to bring people to the gospel, the good news of you and your great rescue uh, of humanity and your big plan. So we ask you to be with us and to bless us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. So uh, if I can, we have with us just a few people that are going to interject a little bit at the beginning and we'll get more to sort of how we can respond to this crisis with more of an apologetic uh, and with a distinctively Christian kind of message. Uh, I didn't expect to have this kind of March madness, <laughs> but things are quite different. But we have uh, Dr. A.J. Roberts with us, uh, Dr. Paco Delgado, and another one of our staff scholars, um, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Uh, of course, with us, too, is President of the Reasons to Be of uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. Another staff scholar, Ken Samples, is on the line, too. And so, AJ, and Paco, and Fuzz, if you want to chime in a little bit, can you give a little bit just of your own professional background and sort of why you're speaking to this issue, especially for those uh, who may not know you directly? So, I trained as a molecular virologist, uh, a cell and molecular biologist, but really emphasis on virology. Uh, when I did my graduate work at UPenn, uh, then I went on to do postdoctoral work in, in <laughs> viruses and viral pathogenesis, uh, developing animal models and testing different vectors for potential vaccines at Yale. And then I did three years, well, I did two years in Russia doing other stuff, uh, public health related stuff. But then uh, I came to the NIH and worked for three years on a small research team uh, leading many of the projects on SARS coronavirus. So I worked at the NIH from 2003 to 2006. So I know a lot about the coronavirus family. I know a lot about the previous SARS outbreak and I'm up to speed on a lot of what's going on with SARS-2, which is the name of the virus that's causing this current pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, that's probably good enough for my background. My name is Francisco Delgado. I go by Paco. Um, I trained as a physician, first in internal medicine and then in infectious diseases. Uh, I did my internal medicine training at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Florida, infectious diseases at Vanderbilt University. I have been in private practice since, oh my goodness, 2002, I think. So I've been doing this for about 18 years or so. And uh, right now I'm based in Indianapolis. So uh, yeah, we see in my practice, we see all all kinds of infectious diseases. And when people ask me, well, what does an infectious diseases doctor do? Now we're at the forefront. Now they know what we do. But before that, you know, we were a little bit of an enigma for a lot of people. Essentially, we deal with infections that have to go from the brain all the way down to your foot. 
And uh, if it is a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, anything, we deal with that uh, essentially. Yeah, when things get really crazy, also people call on us. So yeah, we have a very big practice. I'm uh, uh, Fuzz Rana and uh, a biochemist by training. Also, I've been um, with reasons to believe for 20 years looking at the science, faith, uh, you know, inter- intersection. And, um, you know, uh, my training in biochemistry has been in membrane uh, biochemistry and biophysics. And so uh, not necessarily an expert in virology, but just fascinated with the biochemistry of the virus and particularly the biochemistry associated with the, the viral uh, membrane or the viral uh, envelope. And uh, it's also interesting to me, the, the, the point of attack of the, this virus, it essentially is infecting the alveolar cells, type one and type two cells in the lungs, where the type one cells are the ones that are involved in the, the gas exchange. Uh, and then the type two cells are the ones that produce pulmonary surfactant. And actually did a postdoc um, uh, looking at the, 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 the biochemistry and the biophysics of pulmonary surfactant. And uh, a, a minor, uh, if, I, if I have any kind of claim to fame as a scientist, it would actually be that when I was a postdoc, we ended up discovering a component in pulmonary surfactant that people didn't realize was there, a, a phospholipid component. And so it's, um, for those people keeping score at home, it's specifically a plasmalogen as a major component in pulmonary surfactant that people didn't realize was there. But, you know, part of what happens when pulmonary surfactant isn't uh, produced is you wind up with respiratory distress syndrome. And so this is why in part this, this virus can cause such severe symptoms is because you're compromising the cells involved in gas exchange and the cells involved in producing pulmonary surfactant, uh, which reduces the, the, uh, the air water uh, or the, the surface tension at the air water interface in the lungs. So anyway, so, so don't have really any expertise, so to speak, in public health or in virology. My expertise is in biochemistry, but there's aspects of this virus's biochemistry that, again, I, from a, a science geek standpoint, find to be fascinating. Speaking to the three of you, some of us probably have been reading and are a little bit overwhelmed by all the information that is out there. And it, it can be difficult especially for non-specialists, to sort out um, fact from fiction. I know you all have been talking a lot on this subject. Um, Are there any specific things in your interviews lately and talking with people that you would want to communicate with our scholar community of how to sort out fact and fiction um, on this issue? that would uh, be able to equip us to dialogue with others that you haven't maybe uh, you haven't been seeing or reading something that the community uh, could benefit from? I would probably just go basic. Uh, and, and if it's too basic, then it won't take long. Uh, but, but maybe give just an overview of, the, of a comparison with the virus that's circulating across the globe. I, I think it's now in over 170 different countries. Um, I haven't seen the latest stats just because I've been working on the book manuscript for most of the day to day and not actually focused on the news on on COVID, but um, it, it's a it's a coronavirus. Coronavirus is a, is a family of viruses. As viruses go, it's, it's one of the largest RNA viral families that infects human beings. Uh, the first coronavirus associated with human fatality was the original SARS outbreak, which began in November 2002 and lasted eight months. It, ha- it was almost always symptomatic, although there were some asymptomatic cases. People came down with symptoms within five to seven days. Uh, It had about a 10% fatality rate, uh, but that was concentrated in the elderly. Those over the age of 65 were at particularly high risk. Um, The the fatality rate in those categories of 65 and older approached 50%, but overall global mortality of 10%. It only infected a little over 8,000 people and it killed just under 800. Um, it really surprised us that that was a coronavirus and, and not getting too much into the history, but they, they thought for sure it was, it was influenza because influenza, some of the more pathogenic flus can lead to the same type of 
of acute respiratory distress and, and death by pneumonia. Uh, but, but they found out it wasn't influenza. And as they sort of worked their way through the various respiratory viruses, they started to get positive hits on coronavirus, which really shocked the medical and the scientific community because coronaviruses prior to 2002, 2003 were only associated with the common cold. There are two coronaviruses that circulate in the human population. We've known about them since the 1950s, 1960s, and they just caused the cold. And so they've never been a big deal as far as the medical community or, or by, by a medical community has been concerned. Um, when we discovered that this was a coronavirus in the original SARS outbreak, many people went in and started looking at other respiratory cases uh, that did not have flu. And they started to ask, could these respiratory cases be traced to a coronavirus as well? And so in the immediate months following the SARS outbreak, we identified two more coronaviruses circulating in the human population associated with upper respiratory infections. Uh, and those, I don't well, HKU and, and NK30, uh, NL, NL93 and HKU1 um, for the Netherlands and Hong Kong where those viruses were first isolated. But uh, SARS, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome is another coronavirus that's associated with very poor outcome and high fatality, 35% in the general population, but again, higher in the elderly. Uh, fatality rates in the elderly exceed 80%. Uh, that emerged in 2012. It's still circulating. Uh, well, it still has periodic introductions into the human population. It's not circulating. It actually transmits very poorly from human to human, um, which is good news. Uh, this one has a very high genetic similarity to the original SARS. It's about uh, 80, 85 percent similar to the original SARS. And it, it shares a lot of uh, the diversity within the spike protein, which is the viral binding protein that allows it to enter cells. Uh, but SARS-2, uh, as you know, also emerged from China, uh, as did SARS-1. Uh, it's the first infections began in December, and we are only about four months, four and a half months, arguably, into something that's become a pandemic. Um, it's like I said, it's in over 170 different countries. I'm pretty sure the number of infected is approaching 300,000 worldwide if it hasn't exceeded that already. Uh, the good news is that overall, it's only running about a 4% mortality globally. Uh, Italy has been right around the 10% mark uh, for a couple of weeks now, which is really distressing. Um, South Korea has really curbed the infection there. And so the mortality rate in South Korea is, is approaching, uh, I think about half of a percent, which is still about five times higher than the average mortality rate for annual flu. It, when we talk about flu, uh, it's a different family of viruses. It's not a coronavirus, it's an orthomyxovirus. It's, it's smaller than SARS. It's more fragile in the environment than SARS is. It's primarily associated with, with respiratory infections. SARS can infect uh, many different organs. It can be shed through not just respiratory droplets, but through sweat, through tears, through urine, through feces, um, not through blood milk, uh, not through breast milk. Um, and it can also be isolated in various organs in infected individuals and infected animal models. And so, so it's those two viruses, the coronaviruses, SARS in particular, SARS-2, uh, in comparison, and influenza, although they have initial clinical symptoms, and although they may progress to very severe and even fatal ca cases of pneumonia, uh, the viruses are very, very different biologically, both in the human uh, recipient and in the environment. And so, you know, later I can talk about some environmental hygiene, but I'm sure you've been inundated with a lot of that, about washing your hands and everything, but there really is good good solid evidence that if you want to fight SARS effectively, um, washing your hands is far better if you do it for at least 30 seconds with soap and water, warm water, soap that lathers, uh, be thorough when you wash your hands. And if you're doing that, you're doing much more than you could with any, any type of hand sanitizer, which is, is not, uh, not extremely effective in, in activating SARS. It's pretty good. It's pretty effective across the board at inactivating flu, but not SARS. So 
I don't want to keep talking. Um, if you want more than that, I can give more. Let's have Paco, you were going to give some comments in regards to that. You're a medical doctor. You're working with a hospital and that you've been quite busy. What further comments would you like to give in uh, building upon what AJ said? Well, I, you know, a AJ takes it from the, uh, uh, the biochemical aspect, I really am more into the clinical aspect of this. And I can tell you that, yes, you know, most of the people are going to be asymptomatic or may have a very small, you know, problem. But I, I as infectious diseases physicians, we usually see the very sick people. So I can tell you, oh, this is a very aggressive virus. Uh, it is not something that you should take lightly. And I think that the experience of the Italians can essentially demonstrate that very well. And uh, that's why we really need to be very attentive at what, you know, the authorities from the CDC, the Department of Health are recommending for people to do, uh, because we do not want to be in that situation where, oh, yeah, no, it's, not, it's just going to be a little cold. It shouldn't be much of a problem. Well, it may not be a problem for us if we are young. But then we could be carrying it to our parents or grandparents who are going to be much more vulnerable uh, to, this, to this virus and in which the mortality rate may be much higher than for anybody who is, who is young. So that is, would be the perspective from the clinical aspect of this. You know, I, to me, I think what, what I found to be most helpful was recognizing, you know, as AJ said, the, the, the types of cells that the, the virus attacks because uh, the receptor protein that the virus binds to is ACE2, which is an angiotensin converting enzyme. It's a membrane associated enzyme that uh, is on the, the surface of not only, I think, lung cells, but also uh, a number of different um, surface tissues throughout the body. And so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a protein that's involved in uh, in blood pressure regulation. It's it's found in heart tissue. It's found in kidney tissue. It's found in liver tissue. So it's, it's yeah. pretty widely distributed. So that's you know. So I guess when people wind up with organ failure, it's probably a combination. And Paco and AJ would know better than than I. But it seems like it's a combination of not only being able to unable to get the adequate oxygen into the tissues, but also you you are having those other uh, organ systems being attacked as well. So uh, it seems like it's, it's kind of a, a, you know, double whammy. To sort of dovetail into what uh, Fuzz had said earlier about the, the type 1, type 2 pneumocyte damage um, and, and to what Paco said about, you know, the, certainly the clinical manifestations seem to be worse in the elderly and not as severe in the young, but there have been a couple of publications. I haven't read them in detail. I ran across them last week sometime. Um, Yes, last week. Uh, and and it's, it's suggesting that even the young, even the very young, uh, when, they, when they take chest x-rays, they actually show very similar uh, congested uh, ossification, which is sort of like a ground glass appearance in chest x-rays of the young who aren't necessarily highly symptomatic. And that what they're finding is that uh, even asymptomatic cases uh, on, on recovery that they're actually having uh, reduced lung capacity uh, up to, I, th I think I heard 20 or 30% reduced lung capacity. And so that's an asymptomatic case. So someone that didn't appear sick, wasn't hospitalized. Uh, and so, you know, just pulling from what we knew about SARS-1 pathology, it's, it's not just the destruction of the type 1, type 2 pneumocytes that, that impact the ability of gas exchange in, in the lungs, uh, which can lead to systematic organ failure if you're not getting the proper amount of oxygen to the organs. But it's also sort of a, a, a hyperimmune reaction. Uh, there was a lot of fibrosis that would take part as part of the repair process and the recovery. And so you would have layer upon layer of, of, upon layer of, of uh, fibrotic cells laid down, which would also block the exchange capabilities of the lung tissue. And that would also lead to hypoxia and, and massive organ failure. So maybe, maybe Paco knows more about the medicine, maybe Fuzz knows more about the biochemistry, but I, I brought all of that up to say that there's, there was initially this idea and based on the data and observations that really the elderly are the only ones at risk. And, and what we're seeing now is, is that's not true, uh, that young, 
younger adults who are infected can have uh, at least initial loss of lung capacity, and we don't know if that'll be persistent or if it'll resolve. It's too early to say yet. That is correct. And I think, as you say, AJ, we really have known very little of these coronaviruses. It was only recently that uh, we really are starting to understand a little bit more about the pathophysiology of these viruses. Before that, I mean, you say, oh, you'll get a virus. We didn't really know what were going to be the consequences <laughs> in, the long, in the long run. You're right. And yeah, there is going to be, uh, uh, there are going to be changes in the bodies of people of all ages. And the problem may be that the older people are just not as good as repairing or at recovering from that kind of an infection. You know, I, I would be curious to get uh, Paco and AJ's reaction to this. And then also if there's other people that are um, you know, in, the, in the biomedical fields, uh, there was a report today that I saw. And, and again, you just don't know what is information, what's misinformation anymore, that apparently that even for people that are, are a or at least initially, if you acquire the virus and are asymptomatic, that there's actually a loss of smell and taste, and that that actually could be the first foreshadowing of contracting the virus. I don't know if if, they, if you feel like that's a credible, those are that's credible information or not, but I would just be curious because that could be extremely helpful if that's indeed the case in terms of helping. Yeah, to I haven't, self I haven't seen. I haven't seen anything on that, but it. It wouldn't surprise me if that's true. Uh, again, based on sort of the pathology of SARS, we know that it infects uh, the nasal turbinates uh, early. And so that's, that's one of the routes of infection is through the, the nasal pathways, the nasal turbinates, the cells, the epithelium that lines the nasal pathways or uh, structure. And, and there's also, you know, very few relative, comparatively speaking, little virus enters the brain and it's not in every situation that it actually makes the cross, but if it's infecting the nasal turbinates and if it's affecting either through the inflammatory process in response to the virus or to the virus infection itself, any of the olfactory nerves or cells around the olfactory nerves, then it makes sense to me that that could possibly be an early clinical sign. And the other thing is, yeah. As we age, though, also as we lose our sense of smell, for example, me, I am horrible at smelling things anyway, so I don't think it would help me to figure out if I got infected or not. That's the only problem. We have a question from Mark Clark. So, Mark, Chris, on mute you, and why don't you go ahead and ask? Sure. I've been reading uh, several different sets of projections that uh, apparently the UK government, the United States government, uh, are using or relying on for their response to coronavirus, uh, and they're all pretty bleak in their estimates. And why? And this is why they started pushing from, you know, gatherings of 500, 250 to 50 to 10, and now you know no gatherings, particularly in California and places. Um, but a lot of them have a, a variety of potential projections. I would be curious to see what, uh, if you guys have seen them, which ones do you believe are more credible than others? because there's anywhere from very few deaths, well, at least in the U.S., to as many as 10 million, you know, which, which set of projections have you seen that you think are more reliable than others, if you have? This is all trying to predict the future. And I am not sure if you know that, uh, if, if you know, AJ, about any good way to, to predict uh, something like this that really is unprecedented in the in this history of the world, really. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I've seen all kinds of different projections. I just, I think, and this is just my personal opinion, I don't think we will be Italy, but I don't think we'll be South Korea. And now between that and that is about, you know, a huge variation. And depends also geographically. Uh, you already see the, the events that are happening in New York. There are also other states that haven't been hit that hard that are starting to, you know, put very severe uh, lockdowns in place. So it really will be very variable, I think, I mean, from place to place. What do you think, AJ? Obviously, um, none of us can predict exactly what's going to happen, but um, I, I think that there's going to be uh, noticeable regional differences within the U.S. Uh, I think that right now New York is on track to look just like Italy, uh, and I think that Governor Cuomo is, is doing his darndest to arrest that, um, but the problem becomes when you when you get to a certain... <laughs> 
when you get to a certain point of saturation of the population or seeding, not even saturation, but a seeding of the population, it's, it's very hard to, it's very hard to contain. Um, again, with SARS, the original, uh, three, three public health interventions really helped arrest and put an end to SARS. And, and that was, they identified the animal reservoir in nature and the Chinese government culled tens of thousands of those animals that were the, the animal that introduced it into the human population. They shut down the wet markets where the animals were being sold and where people were coming in contact, and contact with those animals. Uh, everywhere, it, the virus really only made it significantly in, in through, throughout parts of Southern China, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, there was a hot spot and several ca hundred cases in um, uh, Toronto. But because it was primarily symptomatic and because symptoms developed on average within five days, it was easy to uh, isolate and trace. And, and so they practiced barrier protection, which they're trying to practice now, but they're doing it sometimes without the proper equipment or the amount of equipment that they need. Uh, you know, barrier, barrier protection includes gloves, masks, goggles, uh, suits, but also the critical fact was you identify the cases, you isolate those cases, and you immediately contact trace. And then in the case of SARS, they isolated the contacts that they traced that had come in contact with that individual for the preceding week, and then they contact traced those individuals. And so they didn't they didn't quarantine those people in a facility, but they basically put them under this stay at home self isolation protocol. And by contact tracing, by, by testing, by identifying cases, and by contact tracing two circles out, SARS basically was shut down. And, and we think that's why it went away. Some people also speculate that it might have been the warmer months, uh, perhaps. We don't know if that was actually a contributing factor, but the coronaviruses like SARS, MERS, and SARS-2 are pretty hardy in warm environments, uh, unless they're very warm and very high humidity. And what I mean by very warm and very high humidity is over 90 degrees and over 90% humidity. Uh, and then you see some tapering off of the infectivity. I, I'm concerned. We're now, if you look at the global numbers, we're now in position number three, only behind China and Italy. Uh, and, and our case count is is still rising exponentially as as a country uh and so um you know paco said we're not going to be italy i think in some regions we're not going to be italy uh in other regions i'm not sure so, i'm not so sure steve had the question is the reduced lung capacity reversible for those who recover fully paco did mm -hmm. you want to address that that's a a, a tricky question because the problem and the, the reason why we see so much mortality is that really that lung capacity does never recover. And that is the big problem. That's why people need ventilators for, you know, for so long and why many, many people need ventilators. I think that those, uh, as, as, as AJ says, there's going to be a percentage, and I really don't know what percentage of population would have long lasting damage. And I think that long-lasting damage may vary from a very mild, maybe imperceptible damage to more significant lung fibrosis. So it really is going to depend a lot on the, the person. On, uh, it, is, it is very difficult to predict, you know, what's going to happen to, uh, to the infection in one individual. Uh, I, have one comment. I have one comment on that. So yeah. again, Sort of looking at the numbers uh, in the SARS outbreak, although it was a limited number of cases, just over 8,000, 20 to 30 percent of those people uh, required uh, ventilation. Uh, the numbers are, are fluctuating grossly for the current outbreak, but um, Governor Cuomo this morning said in New York it's currently 13 percent, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, so 13 percent of of those hospitalized or, or case count, 13%. It's actually, it's actually a higher number for those that are hospitalized, but um, about 13%, that's good. That's down from earlier estimations where they were saying it was about 17 to 20%. So again, it doesn't seem to be as high as SARS the original, but it's still pretty high if you're talking about 13% of, of cases ending up on 
ventilation. So we, we have another physician, Dr. Nick Tavani, who's a part of uh, the Scholar community. Nick, do you want to ask your question? I think you wanted to direct it to Paco. I was wondering if this virus is going to become seasonal like influenza, and if so, will it mutate and kind of uh, work its way into the population? So we have to deal with a corona season from here on out. If so, would the pandemic-type protocols still be in place? And the third one is, what role does China have in, um, in the source of this and maybe preventing it in the future? Thanks a lot. I actually think that AJ has a very good answer because I've heard it before, so I'll let her actually take, the, take that one. In regard to the, the seasonality, um, we, we just really don't know. The coronaviruses, the ones that cause upper respiratory infection, which suggests, Nick, that those are a little bit wimpier, right? Because if, you're, if your tropism is limited to the upper respiratory tract, it's a cooler environment, right? And, and so those are somewhat seasonal, and the season sort of mirrors the flu season. It lasts a little longer than the flu season, but I have... I have reservations to think that these hardier viruses that actually go into the lower respiratory tract pretty easily and get disseminated to other tissues are necessarily going to be seasonal. Um, the, the other difference between flu seasonality and the biology of the virus and the potential for SARS seasonality and the biology of the virus is that coronaviruses are both respiratory and enteric viruses. They infect both the GI tract and the respiratory tract. And about 30% of cases have GI symptoms associated with it. So um, if, it tends, if it tends to be a little bit seasonal, and I think the other thing that we can ask is, is it currently in the Southern hemisphere where the, where the temperatures have been warmer? And the answer is yes, it's there. And it's through a lot of different countries in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, but the spread in those countries is hard to trace right now because we don't know how extensive the testing is. And so it's been there. It's persisting there. I don't know that the spread is as great there, but I don't know if we're missing the spread because we're not testing. As to whether or not there's going to be antigenic variation like there is with the flu, there is not a lot of antigenic drift with SARS and there's not antigenic shift with coronaviruses. And so the difference between those are Flus are segmented genomes. If you have two different flus infecting the same cell at a time, you can shuffle the genomes and you can actually get very different flus out. That's what causes antigenic shift. Uh, there's a lot of antigenic drift in the hemagglutinin protein, which is the protein on the surface of flu that binds and enters cells. There is some antigenic drift in the SARS spike proteins, but those, those changes are really more associated with um, with, with change in species host and not with changes in the, in the human population. There's one guy that's been tracing uh, different isolates since the, the earliest part of this outbreak, a guy named Trevor Bedford. You can probably Google him uh, and see what he's doing. He's at Fred Hutchison in Washington. And uh, the last I saw from him, those isolates maybe have uh, at most seven different amino acid changes. And he's looking at very early isolates from China and uh, localized outbreaks in different parts of the US and some other places globally. So not a lot of antigenic drift, but, uh, and I don't really think I need to go into this part, but I can if you guys are interested, somebody else can bring the question up again, but, but there, there may be some element of, of the coronaviruses that that Im impact long-term memory and, and impact long-term humoral immunity. <clears throat> so it may be possible that, and this is based on data from MERS patients and work uh, research done by a guy named Stanley Perlman, uh, that individuals who are infected and who recover from infection have high neutralizing antibodies to the virus. So they're able to bind the virus, neutralize the virus and not not have infection, and that's part of the clearance of the virus from the body as well. But those neutralizing antibodies in the case of MERS recovered patients um, seem to be, at least in some cases, transient. And so three, four, five months after recovery, uh, they're no longer detecting neutralizing antibodies in patients who recovered. 
And if that's true, it would suggest that reinfection uh, might be possible on an annual basis. But the speculation is that if you're reinfected, you're going to have base level immunities and the disease won't be as severe in a secondary infection as it was in a primary infection. Um, China certainly ought to bear responsibility uh, for, for the kinds of uh, pandemics that are potentially going to be launched from there. And, and the primary thing that they need to do uh, is they need to shut down their wet markets, their exotic meat markets, where they have wild animals uh, domestically farmed, they have domestically farmed animals alive and stacked on top of one another at hundreds, if not thousands of different kinds of animals under single roofs. Uh, and so you've got all kinds of potential uh, cross infection and exposures of a variety of different types of viruses to different types of animals. And it, it is a virology breeding ground for potential pandemics. And so China really ought to be doing something at a, at a national level to uh, illegalize those markets. So we want to go to Ken Wolgamuth. Uh, Ken, you had a, a question that you wanted to raise. Uh, yeah, just double check with what AJ said. She's been using the terms uh, MERS and SARS-2. Uh, I missed a little connection then. Is this coronavirus right now the one you're referring to as SARS-2 or is this stay as COVID-19? So that'll yeah. be my question, but then a comment. We have a friend right now in Oklahoma City and uh, his wife called me this morning, called Helen and me this morning, and uh, he went into the hospital, sort of one of those stubborn people that was having breathing problems and wouldn't go, finally ended up in the emergency room and uh, got him into the hospital on Monday. And uh, she said she got the confirmation about two days ago that yes, it's COVID-19. So he's, uh, uh, and when he was in the hospital, his blood uh, oxygen was like at half of what it should be. So he was having definite big stress. So pray, prayers for, uh, for Wilson and, and Janet as they and the family lived through this. The children were able to visit with him just very briefly with uh, challenging, uh, let's see, hospital protocols with masks and going in individually. So prayers for that. And then just clarification on SARS-2, uh, which I understand is a coronavirus, and this is a different one. Is that right? So SARS-2 is the name of the virus. Okay. COVID-19 is the name of the disease. Oh, okay. So this one is SARS-2 virus. Yeah, it's. I, I have a really good blog that came out on Friday, Ken. If you okay, go to, look if there. You go to the RTB website. Yeah, I'll go. Okay, I'll look at it. Thank you. My understanding is that there are no um, vaccines for human coronaviruses. I wanted you to tell me if that's actually true, and if it is, then is that an inherent thing because of coronaviruses or? Um, basically, what are the prospects for actually developing a vaccine for SARS-2? We do not have a vaccine for none of the viruses. And uh, I, it is something that is going to take a long time. I don't know. For example, with SARS, the, the disease died very quickly. I do not know if anybody continued pursuing a vaccine for that. Uh, AJ, you might know better, better than that or MERS, this one is going to take a long time. Whether it is going to be available when we still need it, to me, I, I still don't know. So uh, I could talk a lot about this topic again, but um, so there were, there were a lot of vaccine candidates and there were some prophylaxes that were being developed for SARS in 2003 against that virus. Uh, pretty much every vaccine that was targeting the spike protein produce neutralizing antibodies and neutralizing antibodies were absolutely sufficient to protect every animal and animal models. Um, and so the prospect for a vaccine against SARS original 
uh, was very, very promising, uh, but those projects got shut down because the virus really literally disappeared uh, in July of 2003, except for four or five cases in 2004. And only one of those was potentially uh, an environmental exposure. Uh, the other ones were all lab cases of infection. Um, so there are over 20 different vaccines uh, globally currently being developed for SARS-2. Um, it is unlikely that any of those will be available for wide distribution, even if every phase of clinical trial gets fast-tracked and goes well. Uh, in less than a in less than a year, I think I, I think a year, I think twelve months, possibly a little longer, is the fastest that we'll see a vaccine. Um, there are some drug treatments, uh, several several small clinical trials with an intravenously uh, delivered drug um, called remdesivir, which is a <clears throat> compound that is the drug is a is basically an adenosine analog. And so it basically shuts down the viral polymerase protein, which is the protein that copies the virus genome and makes more virus. Uh, so that analog gets incorporated. When it's incorporated, it, they think that the, that the RNA is disassociating with the polymerase and the polymerase isn't able to continue uh, copying the genetic, the genetic, the genome. And so, uh, but it's, again, it's IV. Uh, whether or not it works, we should know by the second week of April, uh, because those clinical trials were initiated in, in early February. Uh, Governor Cuomo again today said that they are going to try some uh, passive antibody transfers under, under um, I forget what it's called, is it called the Compassionate uh, Act of the FDA? That they're gonna basically take convalescent serum, which is serum from patients who have recovered and purify out antibodies and then use those antibodies to treat the most severe cases uh, with the hopes that the antibodies passively transferred will offer protection and boost the immune system. Uh, convalescent serum, passive transfer of antibodies in recovered patients in the SARS-1 outbreak uh, worked very well. There's more than half a dozen uh, case reports out there, various locations, various numbers of people, at least hundreds of different people that uh, received passively transferred antibodies, convalescent serum, and that those plasma and antibody transfers uh, showed really good protection of individuals, which is another strong indication that a vaccine should produce the kind of immunity that we need. You know, uh, AJ, just, uh, just to offer a comment here, um, and again, um, you would perhaps know better than I, but um, you know, the, the use of drugs that would be kind of like uh, ribonucleotide analogs may not be effective on, on this particular virus because there is an exonuclease uh, that this virus produces. So in addition to the RNA dependent uh, polymerase, there's also an exonuclease that gives proofreading capabilities to the, to the rep, you know, reproduction uh, process. So may, that may not work. So the remdesivir has been, again, I have to, you know, I have to qualify almost everything that I say. Um, so mice lie and monkeys exaggerate when it comes to vaccine trials and prophylaxis studies, but uh, the remdesivir has been tried in several animal models. And if it's, if it's delivered either prophylactically before exposure to the virus, or if it's been delivered within the first 24 or 48 hours, I can't quite remember, after exposure to the virus, they've seen that it protects uh, non-human primates, so different types of monkeys, uh, from challenge with, with MERS. And so, so there's good animal model studies that suggest remdesivir doesn't just work in tissue culture, but it actually works in an organism. And so that's, that's been the basis for, for launching those clinical trials. They, they have them in Japan, in China, in Washington State, and I think also in Canada. Um, there's also, I don't know if you've heard, you may have uh, that chloroquine uh, might possibly be a treatment. There's one uh, doctor on Fox uh, yesterday or the day before uh, that said that he had treated the elderly, most severe patients with a combination of azithromycin and uh, hydrochloroquine and uh, those patients were doing well. And so 
chloroquine, hydrochloroquine uh, are drugs that can change the pH of endosomes. It can also change the ability of proteins to glycosylate or have sugar uh, complexes added to the proteins. And, you know, SARS is a virus that enters through the endosome. I, I believe it is pH independent, uh, dependent, uh, and, and chloroquine changes the pH of the endosomes. And so if it's possible, it could have an effect by, by altering the entry of the virus, whether or not glycosylation of the ACE2 receptor, because it's a membrane bound pr protein, I don't know much about its glycosylation and what I do know is, I'm sure Fuzz could probably comment more on this than I could. Uh, most membrane-bound proteins uh, aren't necessarily uh, highly glycosylated, so I don't know if it would have an effect on that as well. If Jason uh, Rampelt is there, you have a question. We'll take a couple of more on this subject, and then kind of big picture, we were planning to move over towards some more apologetics uh, uh, response type questions. How do we respond in a distinctively Christian way um, in light of this situation? But Jason, if you're there, yeah. uh, I'll let you answer your, ask your question. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, AJ, you were already getting onto this topic a little bit, but I just wondered if you could comment on Moderna's uh, RNA therapy in particular, and if a timeline of 12 to 18 months is reasonable. I have no way of judging myself. I'm hoping maybe you could shed some light on that. You know, my speculation is that there have been a lot of DNA vaccines uh, in animal models that absolutely are utter failures when they go into the human, uh, human trials. And, and so DNA-based vaccines in animal models show pretty good protection, especially if you do a prime boost where you're giving more than one dose of the, of the vaccine or you're, you're priming the immune system of the animal model with with perhaps a, a viral vectored vaccine and then coming in and boosting with the DNA or using the DNA as the prime and then the viral vector as the boost. Those have been phenomenal for many different viruses, for many different constructs and, and lots of hope by some really diehard smart scientists. And every one of those that have gone into human trial have just been pretty much utter failure. And so what Moderna's vaccine is based on is, is an mRNA. And so they're basically trying to deliver the RNA so that it will produce the protein uh, once it's, once it's in the organ, once it's in the human, the organism. And so they're, they're bypassing the need for DNA to go to messenger RNA and they're going with the straight delivery of messenger RNA. But, uh, I just haven't seen, I haven't seen many studies, uh, with mRNA based vaccines. And so I don't know how they compare to the DNA vaccines, but I know that if it's anything like the DNA vaccines, I would not be over, 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 uh, overly confident that those are going to work. Also, we have a uh, Steve Willing. Steve, if you're there, we'll um, have you go ahead and answer, ask your question. Pro making these projections depends hugely on how what percentage ultimately gets infected. And with influenza, I read it's five to twenty percent each year. Some people are projecting with coronavirus 70 to 80 percent. Um, basically, is there any science that supports this or is it pure conjecture? I guess the fact that we have essentially a population that has never found this virus makes us all susceptible to, to it. So just by that, you would really we'd be approaching about 100 percent. Now, how much are we going to be able to limit or how many reaches will not be exposed to it? That depends a lot, I think, on the movement of people, which I think is behind the whole idea of trying to limit our uh, contact with other people so that we don't continue passing it on and on. With influenza, we had already some immunity and many people have been vaccinated. So I think that makes the susceptible population a much smaller percentage than, than this one. Yeah, so I'll just piggyback on that. Last year, we had almost 50% of the human, of the U.S. population uh, received influenza vaccines. And we have, we have drugs that can treat influenza within the first 48 hours as well. Um, there's, a, there's something called the R0 or the R factor, the replication factor. It's how many people will one infected person pass the virus onto. Uh, and that number is estimated for flu to be between one and a half and two. Uh, so one infected, one person infected with the flu 
and I don't know if that's number if that's a number for an unvaccinated population or if that's actual observed data for the current global population, which has some underlying immunity to flu, but it's one and a half to two people. The early estimates for SARS-2 is that the R factor, the replication factor, is between two and a half and 3.2 people. And so just early estimates, it's already, you know, at least we're around twice as many as flu, and we're in a 100% naive population. Uh, and so we have no pre-existing immunity to, to this virus, uh, it would seem. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think we'll probably start to see the virus peter out once we hit the 70, 75, 80% infected rate. I think we'll start to have experience uh, herd immunity at that point, that R factor will drop below one. And when the R factor drops below one, basically the virus can't spread effectively through a population any further. So. You're doing a lot of talking, talking to friends, family, even blogging about it. What are, since not everyone has act, direct access to you guys, what are some of the go-to places or resources, web or others, that you would send people uh, to, to, uh, to to help them continue to navigate this from a, from a science perspective? From my standpoint, the best place you can go right now is the CDC website. They have a very, very, very good dedicated coronavirus website which you can really navigate as deep as you want. I think that's the best resource for everyone. And if you're interested in sort of the global picture, there's uh, you could go to who.int for international. Um, they give a daily situation report on the global situation with COVID. And uh, there's a, a website that's hosted by uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Health Security. And they also send out daily situation updates. Uh, and they have a lot of good resources there as well. There are really several other sites that people could go to if they're interested in the science. I think there's a dedicated page at Lancet. I think there's a dedicated page at um, Science News. Uh, if you want to get your news from social media, God bless you. But uh, there are some people that I follow on social media that are that are helpful. The, the man I already mentioned, Trevor Bedford, uh, Helen Branswell, Scott Gottlieb, who was the former uh, head of the FDA. All of those are people that are out on social media, primarily Twitter, uh, but they, they've got some good information out there. You know, uh, something that I've found helpful is actually new scientists. His it's a British, you know, um, popular level science news type magazine. Uh, and they, uh, if you get on their um, email list, they have daily articles dealing with um, SARS-2. And uh, I've, I found it to be, uh, as a, for a lay person, a very a thorough and very accessible source of information. So that's another place I've uh, would recommend if you if you're not interested in going into the into the the brutal details. Jeff Zerwink, who's part of our uh, scholar team as well. Jeff, did you want to ask your final, your question here as we begin to transition? Yeah, sure. I guess I was just unsure whether I joined late, so I didn't know whether it was asked. But uh, you know, it's is is there any realistic way to to prevent roughly 50% of the population from getting this? Because it seems like the social distancing just slows down the rate of infection, but not the overall number infected. So the only way I think that you could get to 50% is essentially for the virus to die out. And that looks really, you know, not very realistic. So there's Wait, that you mean as, as low as 50% or to get so up as high? You will have a certain, so this is, this is what I would see. I would see the curve going up up to let's say 50% and then it, it would die off. You would need to have essentially complete social isolation for the virus to die out without pass, being passed on to person, from person to person. That would be very nice, but I don't think that that is very realistic. Now, and the, yes, because the population at large is susceptible, I think that we are going to get, as AJ was saying, that everyone is going to be exposed. And the only thing that is going to bring it down from 100% to anywhere lower than that is going to be herd immunity, where there's going to be a significant percentage of the population, a significant amount that will be immune to this virus that will not be able to pass it on to those that are still susceptible to it. 
important point to make is that self-isolation is still really, really necessary at this point because because right now, and Paco said this earlier, you know, the difference between South Korea and and Italy is is the curve is you know the the curve in Italy is is still a, an exponential one, and it and it is in the U.S. as well. And so when they talk about flattening the curve, it's slowing the spread. It's not slowing the spread in order to stop it, it's slowing the spread in order not to overwhelm our healthcare system because you're gonna have more deaths if our healthcare system gets overwhelmed. And so to save as many people as you can as this continues a slow burn through the human population is, is to take the measures that we're taking now. No, and I get that. And I guess kind of the, it, it's been unclear to me as I've been listening whether this is a we can prevent people from getting it or we're slowing it down. And so I appreciate, you know, what I get from you is that we're slowing it down. Basically, everybody's going to be exposed, more or less everybody's going to be exposed to some pretty high level, to multiple tens of percents. So Paco, correct me if you think what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I say next is, is wrong. <laughs> but, but I have the very, um, I have a, a deep intuition that the reason that, they're, that you're, you have a, a take that seems like there's ambiguity in the message that you're receiving, Jeff, is that um, that that may in fact be a little bit intentional. I, I think that you want the population to think that we can help contribute to the stop of the spread of the virus, even if you know deep in your heart that we're not going to stop it, we're only going to slow it down. Um, I think that you know maybe some of that is to help alleviate an overwhelming sense of panic. Oh my gosh, 80 or 90% of the human population is going to get this virus. I think that I think that would freak a lot of people out. Uh, and I think if you tell people to stay home because what you really want them to do is just to slow the rate of infection down or the rate of spread down, that's not going to be as motivating as saying stay at home, help us stop the spread of the virus, you know, and 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 being somewhat ambiguous in what you mean when you say help us stop the spread. Do you really mean stop the spread or do you mean slow the spread? That's just, that's how I look at it, Jeff. I don't. No, I, no. And, and that's fair. But the, so now, but that's into a question of who are you socially manipulating? And for someone who's an immense rule follower, that becomes debilitating. It, 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 yeah. So there, there's both sides of that manipulation. And so your, your, your answer has been very helpful. So let me ask AJ and, and Paco, um, what, what sort of apologetic questions have been raised in your interviews and in talking with people? I know we have the mandate as Christians to love God and love neighbor. Uh, we can have that vision and we need to in, in, intend to accomplish it, but what are some of the means of accomplishing that? What are some of the things that are being raised for you, not just as scientists, but also as Christians? You know, fear makes people act in their most basic ways. And I think that fear will show up what the worldview of a person uh, really is. The more that, that a, a, a person embraces a, this is it, materialistic worldview, it is going to be more, you know, I'm going to hoard all the, all the, hoard all the toilet paper that I can because there may not be tomorrow. And that is probably something that it pains me. It, it makes me very sad to see even, uh, you know, uh, even in the medical community or in the, in the community at large to see how people may try to protect themselves instead of really reaching out. The Christian tradition, you know, setting up hospitals, helping the needy was to move towards a disaster, not away from the disaster, essentially from know knowing that our lives are safe in Jesus Christ, and that there is no greater love than that who puts his life, you know, for their friends. To me, that is the, probably the strongest message that we can send as Christians with our attitudes while we're doing, dealing with this crisis. Hey, Paco, um, I, I teach applied ethics um, in, the, in the history of Christianity. One of the uh, one of the well-known persons who started hospices was St. Basil. In your, in your answer, a person like me or, or just listening to you, I think we might feel a tension of there's that sense of drawing towards and helping the sick 
yet at the same time you have a message of uh you know isolating yourself not infecting others how do you live between those two tensions and aj feel free to respond as well i think it is important also is a be there is a be uh to be very careful to be very prudent in the way that we do these things i wouldn't make any more good for me to go to a patient and expose myself and die in one week then that's it <laughs> whereas if i expose if if i treat a patient you know with a proper gear with a proper protection not only can i make something good for that patient right now but i can be saving my health to help even more people not just one so i think that there has to be some uh you know wisdom in the way that we do these things so yeah i don't think that i would go to the say oh, it doesn't matter god will protect me i will just go and you know cavalierly do something that really would be would be detrimental for the for the mission that god has for us here so i i heard a great quote in 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 regard to that paco uh just a couple of days ago uh it was a pastor that was being interviewed on one of the on the you know 24 hour 7 uh, news channels it was a pastor from a church in bab in uh, a baptist church in texas and he said now's the chance for us to be fearless but not stupid <laughs> and i thought you know that's that's really brilliant you know fearless because our lives are secure in christ but but not foolhardy not stupid um you know another way of putting that i think is reach out but wash your hands <laughs> before you do right um so so just practice the personal hygiene and the environmental hygiene as you move to try and and build bridges to to help care for the people who might need someone to help care for them people that are already isolated who live alone obviously the elderly the more vulnerable the sick but i would say even you know we as christians we ought to be even concerned i think about the healthcare workers at this point you know they're taking on huge risks and they're coming home exhausted and and working all kinds of shifts and maybe they don't have the resources to go out and shop for themselves and so i have a uh, a close spiritual friend who lives in Virginia that he and his wife basically just sent an e uh, a letter a hand handwritten letter to all of their neighbors uh that basically just said you know we realize that you may get to a point where you can't leave your house we want you to know that we're here for you if there's anything that we can do any any run to the grocery store or the pharmacy uh you know or even if you just find yourself going stir crazy we'd be happy to sit in the open air of our porch at a distance and uh and just chat with you uh and then he said you know my wife is trained as a nurse practitioner and i'm i'm in pastoral care and he goes so if either one of those services could benefit you either so just this this idea of sort of taking very practical steps to make yourself available to your neighbors to make yourself available to people in your church even though you're not still meeting together i hope uh make yourself available maybe to the local clinic or hospital just to you know call up and say is there anything that i can do to help make your work there any easier um if you're hoarding stop it <laughs> if you have a lot of masks go take them to the nearest hospital give them up for the sake of others think basil i'm i'm summing up it kind of said simplify your life so you have much to share with others um is one nice phrase that we can contemplate I see I mean I know we have Ken Samples here uh, Dr. Hugh Ross is also present um I don't, Ken and AJ you and and Dr. Ross we have talked about this before Ken philosophers distinguish between natural evils and and moral evils um how how do we look at something like this do we see it as a natural evil evil a moral evil a mixture and how do we respond to others when they raise that this sort of thing this pandemic counts as evidence against god maybe ken if you're willing to talk about that or aj or hugh you want to jump in you know i i think something that we've been talking about at reasons to believe for a long time about the problem of pain suffering and evil um and i think it relates uh to this question of is it is it natural evil or is it moral evil And of course one of the things that we have said is that when it comes to many of the natural disasters in the world there's a trade-off you know earthquakes are very destructive but 
you know, plate tectonics is necessary to a, a live planet. Um, I've talked to AJ, you know, there are many viruses that are, that are good. I, I think it's important to be able to say uh, that there is this trade-off in nature. I think it's also important to be able to communicate that moral evil can contribute to natural evil. Um, obviously, there are places, particularly China, um, if they had been uh, more circumspect, uh, if they had been on top of some of these things, it may not have uh, been nearly as bad. I, I wonder if I could say something uh, about history. You know, this isn't, of course, the first time that Christians have faced these uh, plagues. Um, I'm writing a piece right now on, um, you know, how do Christians respond to some of these kinds of things. In the ancient Roman world, there were plagues. This was long before modern science. Um, the Christian application of love of neighbor, caring for people, um, it really helped the spread of Christianity because non-Christians looked at this and said, this is a religion where they value human beings and they have, uh, they have courage. I think of Martin Luther and some of the comments that he made during the uh, the plague during the time of the Reformation. Um, and, you know, what, what's interesting, too, is I think that we can we can encourage people down in this this time of sheltering in. I was reading a, a historical note about Isaac Newton, that part of his development of gravitational theory came during him being isolated. I think of Blaise Pascal, who talked about the, uh, you know, the difficulty sometimes of being alone with your thoughts. Uh, I think these are things that we can talk with people about. Uh, you know, there's a need for blood. There's a need to look into the elderly. I think there's a lot of good things that we can communicate to people. Hugh, you uh, wanted to comment on some of this. We'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of comments on my social media, and I've been, written two blogs that address the two that I've been getting most frequently. The first one that actually came out today was, uh, you know, is this a fulfillment of end times prophecy? Is this the plague of Revelation 6? And basically made the point that Ken has made, uh, you know, pandemics of this nature typically happen about once every one or two centuries. It's been a century since we've had one. So this is really not out of the ordinary, unless, of course, this thing mutates or leads to other viruses and has, a, has a cascading effect. But if it goes the way people are projecting, uh, I don't see this as a fulfillment of end times prophecy, particularly in light of the fact we're not seeing uh, the concomitant signs that you'd expect if this was a fulfillment of end times prophecy. It's just one of multiple signs that would need to be fulfilled for this to be the case. I think the more significant piece is one I got coming out next week, which is looking at, uh, you know, why would a good God create a world with viruses? And basically, again, makes the point that Ken makes is that, you know, in a world where you've got gravity and thermodynamics and electromagnetism, you're going to have things like tornadoes and earthquakes and wildfires. But as you look at other natural disasters, we recognize they're all optimized to make the most best possible benefit for global human civilization. And I would argue the same thing's true of viruses. And so I'm not trying to repeat what I think AJ and uh, you know, uh, uh, Fuzz will be writing. I kind of focused on the geophysics of uh, viruses, all the geophysical benefits. Some of it is stuff that's actually in my future book on climate change, how viruses actually play a crucial role and making sure that we've got the kind of climate stability we need for civilization, actually plays a role in regulating the greenhouse gases, plays a very important role in the carbon cycle, the geochemical carbon cycle for our planet, and go on to list other benefits too, like with the water cycle. So just basically making the point, yeah, good God, given the physics of the universe, yeah, viruses play a crucial, very beneficial role but also making AJ's point that uh, when humans begin to abuse their environment, don't be surprised that we wind up getting virus strains 
that God never intended. And so just the unintended consequences of having these live animal markets in dense uh, you know, populations, also in contact with dense populations of humans, uh, this is an environment for allowing these viruses to mutate and cause these deadly things that we see here. So there's ways that we can actually manage the planet where we minimize uh, the negative or deleterious effects of these viruses and maximize the beneficial effects. And I think it's something a lot of people haven't thought about. You know, viruses are actually good. Most lay people are running to think that they're 100% bad. And, uh, you know, it's like mosquitoes. They're not 100% bad, but we can make them worse than God intended. I think that, you know, when, there's several ways we can sort of shift a conversation. I, I have heard a lot of people mostly, you know, sniping on other people's pages on social media about about this virus and, and the ludicrousy of thinking that, you know, God's good if he's allowing these kinds of things to happen. But I think we can shift those conversations, uh, not just by pointing out, the very good things that the vast majority of viruses do, uh, but also to sort of what what Hugh is just saying, sort of shift part of the responsibility back on us for mismanaging creation. And I think that that is a really valid point to bring out because many of these viruses would not be making jumps into the human population if we weren't doing things that that we really shouldn't be doing as far as caring for animals and even just like how we raise chickens. Uh, but these wet markets for the exotic wild and domestic animals in China are just, there's a, there's a, a video that I just saw today that I haven't been able to finish watching, but as soon as I finish watching it, I'll post it to social media, but it's basically showing how atrocious these markets are. And, and I think, I think if this vir if this video would go viral, um, that people would sort of be up in arms about having having those places shut down. And if they if they're not up in arms, they should be. And and so I just one of the other ways I think we can shift the conversation. I wouldn't do this publicly, but I would do it one on one. Uh, and that's to say, to sort of echo what again I I listened to Governor. Cuomo's uh, news briefing earlier this morning, and he just had some really great talking points that came out of it. One of them was, we've got to find a way to, to uh, implement social distancing, but we also need to find a way to be spiritually connected. And he goes, I know the question, I just don't know the answer on how we do that. And so, you know, to take, to take that kind of question from a top political official and, and use that as a, as a shifting point for a conversation but also, I think to sort of pick up on some other things, and I'll, I'll just one more comment, and that's it. I'll, I'll close with this one: that you know, most most virologists who follow the potential for pandemics and viral epidemiology and disease are are fairly certain that the next pandemic is going to be an influenza one, and and there are certainly pathogens out there that are far more severe than this one. And this current pandemic is showing multiple countries. Uh, the holes in their preparedness and their healthcare systems. And by the grace of God, not by the judgment of God, by the grace of God, this pandemic is not very severe. It could be a lot worse if, if one of those other highly pathogenic flu vi viruses, a more pathogenic coronavirus, a more pathogenic virus that we're not yet aware of, were to start a pandemic. Um, how do we know that this isn't just an invitation for Christians to step out and show mercy and be loving in the name of Christ as our entire global population feels a need for spiritual connection and a fear and an uncertainty. How do we know that this isn't our opportunity and our training, our, our sort of practice ground as well for something that might be far worse that's coming next? So how do we know that this isn't actually God's mercy to us rather than God's judgment to us? And also, I think we should use this kind of an opportunity to invite people into the sciences, to be into basic sciences and the clinical sciences. I think that this is a great opportunity. If we could make it happen, that would be wonderful. I tell you, we have very few infectious diseases physicians in this country. And right now we're realizing, oh my goodness, yeah, we need a lot of us all over the place, but there's, there's very few. We need Christians to step up to this kind of challenge. Um, Mark Clark, you uh, had an observation. Did you want to share that with us? 
we also have to look at government systems. Uh, some of what they've been doing, particularly in the case of China, is exacerbating the problem. Not just the wet markets allowing for that, but even their initial response of, you know, quarantining some of the doctors who were trying to let people know about this. Uh, and that's a government system thing. And, and I know that's sort of problematic for what we do, but it, it clearly, there's a, gonna be a lot of questioning of how countries are handling this. But a personal observation from an apologetic perspective that I thought has been interesting in the last few days, I have seen more of my former students call and see how we're doing. They know I have what's called reactive airway disease, uh, which makes me vulnerable to this. And I think AJ, Hugh, and others are, have similar kinds of vulnerabilities to this particular uh, infectious disease. Uh, but what's fascinating is this, this uh, a neighbor of ours who I reached out to about a year and a half ago on a personal level to kind of encourage them, talk how their soul, pray for them. They're, they're on their way to Christianity, but not yet there. They reached out to us and asked, can they shop for us? And it's just been kind of fun to watch some of that investment in human relations that we've had, uh, paying dividends that I did not expect, and that will continue. And I, I think just to maybe encourage us all, those, those dividends, those, those investments that we've been making in other people's lives, not for our own purposes, but for them as human beings, for Christ, um, they're going to start paying dividends, I think, as much as challenges that we've been talking about. So just encourage us in that way, I think. Good points, Mark, about not just being available to, to give out, but receive too um, in the midst of that. So I like those comments. We did something similar in our neighborhood. My wife asked some, some neighbors who, who skew on, on the older side if we could shop for them. They were doing okay. but So I appreciate your suggestion. That's a good way to, to reach out. And I think Kevin Birdwell just made a comment. Kevin, do you want to speak it uh, to the group? Sure. And I, I know I'm I know I'm preaching to the choir here because I know that I know a lot of you personally, and I know that you are strong believers in prayer and what you pray to the Lord. But I, you know, it's so easy to get almost a demoralized feeling when you you hear all of this constant talk about the virus, you know, on the news, it's everywhere. And I think we just, you know, I need to remind myself, and I think we just need to remember that when we pray, we're really praying to a real God. We pray about the issue. We just need to believe what we're praying. You know, I mean, that's, it's simple, but I, it's something I, I can never stop reminding myself about that. No, that, that's good. And sometimes, you know, there's a saying that sometimes the choir forgets the music. So it's good to encourage the choir and, and remind them of, of the music that we're, that we're singing together. Buzz, you had a, uh, an issue that uh, hadn't been raised yet and you wanted to go ahead and raise it. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, this is uh, something that I see quite often um, on both my Facebook and Twitter uh, accounts when I'm interacting, particularly with skeptics. And it's this idea that, look, science ultimately solves problems what good is Christianity really in, in, a, in, in circumstances like this? And, and it seems to me like this is going to be something that will, uh, and will be an apologetics issue that comes up, um, you know, particularly because there's just incredible work that's being done by people in the biomedical community who are on the front lines treating this by researchers that are working on vaccines and other uh, therapeutics. And so that almost looks like this circumstance lends itself very easily to open, opening up that criticism. And so I've been, you know, giving uh, quite a bit of thought to this particular objection and, and probably will do some kind of Facebook live session in the, in the near future on it or something or write an article about it. But, but it seems to me like this is something that I think we also need to be prepared to engage. And, you know, and as I thought about this, and I'd really be interested in your perspective, George, and also. Ken's perspective and other philosophers, but it seems to me that the, what the value that Christianity brings to the table is really kind of the worldview consideration where it sets up a milieu where science is even possible or sets up a milieu where human life is valued to the point that we're willing to make these kind of investments, uh, you know, in, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, treating people that are sick or again the investments to try to discover you know treatments because if you you take a, a strictly darwinian view of this i mean you could just simply say hey you know what let's just let this thing run its course and 
those people that are going to make it are going to make it and the survivors are going to be better off for it. That's the, you know, because they're going to have the immunity and the weak are going to be culled from our midst. And hey, maybe this might even trim the, you know, the human population. So a, a strictly materialistic worldview would have a very different response to this than, than I think what we're, we're seeing. Because even when the response is inadequate, uh, it, the people are lamenting the fact that the response is inadequate and, and seeing it as a tragedy. So anyway, this is, I think, an apologetic issue that we need to be uh, equipped to engage because I, I see this as really making this criticism, uh, making us vulnerable to this criticism that science solves problems. What good is Christianity really? Ken, did you want to go ahead and make a comment on that since Buzz uh, mentioned you? Yeah, I appreciate that very much. I have a, a book manuscript that uh, I've completed and it's going through review. George, Mark Perez, Wynn Corsion, Dave Rogstad. Uh, the second chapter of the book, uh, the second chapter is entitled, um, um, what is the title of it? It is entitled, uh, I've Got Science, Why Do I Need Faith? In God. In, in God, yeah. I I think, Fuzz, what's very interesting, and you know, having worked at RTB for almost 23 years, whenever we get new scientists in, either visiting scholars or staff scholars, I always ask them, um, why does science work? And uh, we've had this kind of running discussion. I, I really do think that many secular scientists, particularly outspoken atheists, Sean Carroll, Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, uh, et cetera, I think they have this belief that science is merely a practice and it's independent of beliefs, particularly worldview beliefs. So if you just follow the practice, you'll arrive at truth. When in reality, there are all of these worldview assumptions that go into science. I remember having a debate with a um, professor at the University of Fresno up here in Northern California, sharp guy, uh, an evolutionist, and uh, he started out the debate with me saying that as a scientist, I have no beliefs. And uh, when it was my turn to talk, I said, look, it seems to me you have many beliefs uh, that there's a real world out there that you can trust math and logic, that your cognitive faculties and sensory organs function pretty well, that there's a congruence between um, our minds and ultimate reality. These assumptions fit real, very, very well into a Judeo-Christian worldview perspective. And um, I, I think it's important to be able to point out that there are these worldview considerations. Um, I know this is a bit controversial, but I wonder whether science could have emerged if there were other worldviews at the time. Um, and so I, I think that that's a, a very important point uh, to raise. Uh, and that's coming out in my book as, as well. And I'm hoping it won't be my last book, and I hope to get to see it published real soon. Sure, I'm sure you will, Ken. Uh, Jason Rempelt uh, wanted to ask a question or make a comment. Jason, we'll go to you quickly and then over to Steve Willing, who wants to pick up on something we just talked about. Yeah, there's been a, a lot of mention about China, the wet markets, and what they could have done or didn't do. Um, we have the privilege of a Chinese foreign exchange student living with us right now, who was actually um, stuck over there for the uh, spring holiday and did make it back to the United States uh, safely here. We're all fine. Um, but I've learned a lot about um, medicine in China from him. His father is actually a surgeon there. Um, and there's, it's important, I, I think, to make a distinction between the Chinese government and the Chinese people. Um, what, what has been observed was a lot of volunteerism of, uh, among, the, among Chinese physicians, volunteering to go into Wuhan and care for patients there. So while we see a lot of things that are very distressing about how the government's responded, there's a lot of um, um, other things that we can oftentimes use maybe to connect with uh, Chinese people who might be in conversation with us, things that are positive that we can say um, it just as, as a way of maybe entering the conversation more gracefully. I can just ask you guys, if you really don't mind, please pray for all of us who are there in the hospital. This is extremely stressful at some times and we really 
need your prayers for us and also for us to be transparent and for us to be able to share the gospel to those around us that don't know Jesus and that, and that are in the front lines of all this. So your prayers are very much appreciated. Hugh, are there, are there other apologetic issues or, or comments that you would like to make uh, in your own experience? As Mark said, you, AJ, uh, himself have some risk. Uh, I myself have ankylosing spondylitis, my former, uh, the former uh, scholar manager, Bob Stewart has similar. And so we take, uh, I take Cosentex. I have some risk about that. Um, how, how are you communicating to people about balancing this idea about reaching out, but also, uh, you know, protecting yourself, but, but, but also living out the Christian message in the midst of uh, this pandemic? Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, I think, one real benefit is we live in the 21st century. I mean, the very fact that we can be uh, socially distant from one another and yet socially intimate with one another, thanks to the technology that we have. And so just encouraging people who are believers, look, take advantage of this, reach out to your neighbors, reach out to people, uh, you know, don't shut down everything. I mean, uh, it was a thrill for me to do my Sunday class, for example, uh, through a virtual. People didn't like the virtual treats, uh, but it was really good to really have this engagement going on. And what's fun is we recruited a lot of people from different countries who otherwise wouldn't have been involved. So there are opportunities there. And also, um, I would like the message of receiving. I mean, it's been a blessing to Kathy and me that uh, you know, people have reached out to us to, to say, hey, you know, uh, you really shouldn't be going outside since you're in such a high risk category. Uh, you know, let us please uh, do shopping for you. And so uh, it's just been really encouraging uh, for both of us to just see people reaching out in that way. Like, I mean, uh, you don't want to be in the house all the time. We try to pick a time when we can go outside for a walk where there's not going to be a lot of people around. But just seeing how encouraging people are to one another. And, you know, I'm just realizing America is a country where the population uh, tends to be kind and generous more than I've seen in other uh, countries that I've visited. And so just encouraging that all the more to realize, you know, that's a Christian heritage that still lingers to some degree. And maybe we can take advantage of that to get people back to uh, their Christian roots and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, where there's fear, there's opportunities to share our faith. And so let's look at this as, you know, in one sense, a spiritual opportunity that God has given us. Hi, this is Jim, and I have uh, just a couple of quick comments on this. I, along with all that's been said about something positive about this, and um, I just wrote a little blog and I put it on my website and sent it out, and, and about five things. One thing is, we have lost the family meal. What a great opportunity to get back to the family meal, you know? And the second thing is, the research out there shows that if you have kids involved in making things, they eat new things. That's a great thing, too. And then we keep talking about all the public health ideas, and that's wonderful. But as we go along, it seems like most people are going to get this, um, according to the, what I keep hearing. And so the third thing is build up our own immune system. Why not start making things at home? We can't go to restaurants. In, in Illinois, we're locked out. And so we, we have to do things at home. And so then I gave a list of, of herbs and just showed, look at all of these amazing, tasty herbs. Let's make things tasty and delicious and healthy by stealth and learn to do that at home. And then the last thing is we used to do probiotics all over the world. Every, every country uh, fermented things until they came to America and got refrigerators and then we quit. What a great opportunity to get back into eating fermented foods and building up our own immune system. Jim, what's your, what's your website? You want to mention that again? It's just drjimpainter.com. Uh, and so it's a little COVID uh, RX for delicious and nutritious. I put it on the top of my webpage about let's just focus on, gee, get off of the virus and get on to us. Building ourselves up, you know, in our, in our physical bodies while we're shut in at home. Uh, that's Dr. Jim Painter, uh, nutritionist, was just a visiting scholar out here uh, a few months back. So thanks for those comments, Jim. Uh, just because we, we started with them in, in that Paco and AJ, Plus, are there any final comments that you would like to make before we do what so many have suggested, uh, pray for those in the medical field 
and uh, as we've talked about also that the the gospel would be preached in that Paco AJ final comment Paco I have a question uh, and and then a comment the, the question from Paco is uh, what what is a practical thing that we could do for the healthcare workers in our community uh, I mean is there is there a way that we could reach out to you guys while you're at work or or bring a care package or something like that and then my comment is that you know, one of the great things that, that's come out of this for me uh, is my mother is in a full skilled nursing facility in Oklahoma City, and they basically shut the facility down from external visitors um, a week and a half ago. And and as you can imagine, that population is very, very vulnerable and, and could be very isolated if they don't have their daily contacts. And my mom had progressed to the point where she wasn't answering the phone very much. She and I were able to talk almost every day, uh, at least for like the last year and a half. And uh, since they've locked the facility down, they've also implemented FaceTime calls. And so they, they provide a mobile device uh, and, and they schedule a time with me. And then they go into my mom's room and I'm able to FaceTime with my mom. Doesn't always work well, but, but it, it's, it's a blessing. And, you know, she gets to see me and I get to see her. And sometimes that registers. That actually led me to make a suggestion to some people who are involved in various churches that, some of their community, when they when we can't draw together and commute, don't have access to uh, online devices. And yet many of us who are having to sequester in our home environments now are inundated with multiple devices to connect. And so maybe the churches could do uh, a re redistribution of devices so that the people who don't have a way of connecting by virtual connection can engage during during this time where virtual connection is is the primary way that we're making those connections. Anyway, Paco, can you answer my question? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you who are probably the most unrecognized and more important uh, workers in the healthcare industry are nurses, respiratory therapists. If you know a nurse, if you know someone who really has to deal directly with these patients, because the nurses are there essentially all the time in the units where the, where the sick patients are. They are coming in and out of the room. They are really very, in a way, not, not afraid, but they are stressed that they could get this thing and take it to their family. So if you know any nurse, respiratory therapist, anybody, just say, how can I help you? I mean, I'm sure that they'll be like, you know, wait, just praying or taking them, you know, the kids for a while while they take a, a hot bath and relax. I think simple things like that are going to be very, very important for them. I feel privileged. Every time I go see a patient, I'm already in another big suit. So my, my, my exposure is limited. <laughs> but those, those workers are really, really under the, under the pressure of all that. Well, Paco, would it be too much for me? Since you are there, you have some of that insight, some of that passion. Could I ask you to pray on behalf of our medical workers and, and um, those nurses <laughs> that you spoke so highly about? And Ken, uh, Ken Samples, if I could uh, ask you after Paco is done praying, maybe give a, a benediction over us, a, a prayer to um, send us out with uh, God's wisdom, as we've talked about, uh, his empowering grace. Um, and just the ability to, to love people as we're supposed to. Could I, could I make a request that um, someone who's already praying uh, or Mark, add Mark, uh, but could we also pray for the world leaders that are making the decisions for? Yeah, thanks. Great. Let's go Paco, Mark, and then over to Ken, and we'll, we'll conclude with prayer. Dear Lord, it is a privilege always to come in front of you and to your own, to your presence, to your holy presence, and to ask you to be with us, Lord. I pray throughout this terrible time that our world is going, Lord, there's people that are putting their lives at risk to try to help others, to try to get them well, even putting their own lives in the line. I pray, Lord, that you put us a special barrier of protection through them, through their families, Lord. These are very trying times. They're very difficult times. I pray that you can speak, if not directly to each one of these 
healthcare workers that may we may be instruments to speak to them about your love, about our destiny in you, and about our calling. Because in a way, we are doing this, Lord, because it is it is a calling. Lord, just help us get through this and show the strength of your church to all those that still need to know you, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And Father in heaven, um, I think we ask that you uh, uh, watch over and care for all the various uh, people in government, the various types of governments we have across the world that are coping with us or attempting to cope with this, this novel uh, virus. Lord, I ask that you give wisdom to all the executive uh, branches, those that are on the front lines that are executing uh, whatever policies they have in place to, uh, for public health uh, and military support, intelligence support, uh, all the various bureaucracies that are being engaged to support this. I pray that governments would be more transparent than ever before. I pray too that the legislative branches, components, uh, would be cooperative, would be uh, swift and in their deliberations, be just and true. And Father, that they would work together, uh, not out of panic, uh, but out of real concern that there are things they can do that we can do as a country, as all countries can do, to slow this spread, to flatten that curve. I pray, pray too for the judiciary branches that uh, when people bring challenges in courts, that they use wisdom in, in adjudicating these cases because Father, this is gonna be a time of chaos uh, for a lot of governing agencies and a lot of bureaucracies and a lot of uh, healthcare officials. Lord, we ask this because Paul commands us to pray for these governing authorities that we can live a peaceful life, but that the full purpose of which is so that too, we can bring the gospel to many more. And Lord, I pray and ask that we as believers pay attention to what Paul says in first timothy chapter 2 about praying praying for governments that all christians across around the world in whatever type of government that exists whether it's communist authoritarian democratic or a mix lord that they'd be praying for their government officials and that again they would pursue truth uh, and peace and be just restrain the expression of evil and promote that which is good for all societies and i pray this in jesus name Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your love for us. We recognize that love being given to us through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we also recognize the gift of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know that you are a God of miracles. We know, Lord, that you are sovereign. You are the King of creation. And Father, I would ask that uh, you would intervene in our world, that you would uh, give deep insight, as Mark prayed, to leaders, scientists, people in the medical fields. Father, I pray in particular for the people who have been involved in this, this uh, discussion. I pray, Lord, that you will give us leadership so that we can be encouraging and strengthening to our families, to the people that we know, Lord, that you would give us an abundance of faith, hope, and love, Lord, that uh, your grace would uh, enrich all of our lives. And uh, Father, we, we praise you, and um, we pray the benediction of 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.